Good morning and good evening, wherever you are. Good afternoon, uh, good middle of the night, maybe. Um, good morning and uh, welcome back to University of the Arts London for the second day of our symposium on practice research in social design. Uh, definitions, contexts, and futures. Uh, my name is Lucy Kimball. I'm a professor of contemporary design practices and director of the Social Design Institute here at UAL. Um, and uh, a brief reminder that this event is being filmed and live streamed, and we are trying to host an effective and enjoyable event that's hybrid, um, that meets the, the needs both of online participants and those of you in the room here today at Chelsea. Um, today we have five um, very exci exciting and wide-ranging panels um, and they're going to ask and hopefully answer some difficult questions about practice research in social design and design for sustainability. Um, and each of these includes very experienced and, and uh, well-known speakers with a range of positions, institutional locations and perspectives on design, practice and research. Some of them are in the room with us today. Some of them are present through pre-recorded video contributions. This is because we wanted to broaden the discussion um, without contributing to carbon emissions through international travel. Um, and over the last two years, obviously, many of us uh, have participated in different kinds of hybrid events uh, as a, a, in the light of the pandemic. Um, so we are trying to do our own form of that today with the resources that we have and try and get the right balance. Um, let me start with a few opening remarks, building on yesterday's very um, you know, stimulating opening, uh, which was to set the scene um, beyond design practice research. And that really established that practice research is um, really strongly emerged and visible in several academic fields. We particularly heard about cultural geography yesterday. Um, and it's, it's challenging assumptions about the nature of research itself, of knowledge, of evidence and publics, and, and making uh, requirements really of institutions and funders um, and um, assumptions about um, how you translate research uh, into uh, action um, and anticipating change and revealing very much the entanglements with the world uh, and, and, and different participants in worlds. So um, it's not surprising, therefore, that practice research in design um, is emerging or has emerged as a distinctive uh, and important societal capability beyond the creative industries and beyond human computer interaction and applicable to a wide range of social and public policy issues. And we're really delighted that many of the leading um, researchers in that have joined, uh, joined today as speakers. It's timely, therefore, to take a closer look at practice research in social design. So to do this, we've brought together an international group of researchers, including early career researchers and some PhD students to share their perspectives. Um, a couple of practical matters before we start. We're going to be serving food and drink at regular intervals at the Red Room, just the room over to the right. Um, if you hear a fire alarm, please um, follow instructions to leave the building as quickly as possible using the fire exits, which are clearly labelled, and that staircase in that direction. Um, if you're on social media, we're using the hashtag uh, capital D Design, capital P Practice, capital R Research. Um, and in terms of the program, you obviously as participants were sent it, but if you'd like, if you haven't got it to hand, there's a QR code which you'll see in a couple of places around the room. There are also a few printed copies if you'd like those. And to our online participants, um, you'll hopefully easily find it online. Um, and um, I also want to mention before we start a, a, a series of about 10 or so short videos showcasing practice research by UAL colleagues and PhD students that went live, I think, yesterday uh, or the day before. Um, and that video showcase is a way of bringing together, bringing different perspectives um, into this conversation. And you'll find these videos on the Social Design Institute webpage and then also in the link for the materials for, for joining the joining instructions. But we'll also be playing them um, at lunchtime. So some of those people are in the room today and we very much hope you'll introduce yourself if you don't know them and find out more about their work. Um, and then finally, it's usual to thank a load of people at the end of the event. Um, we decided to do this up front just to reveal the, the labor and the resources uh, to make something like this happen. 
um, and the expertise. And in particular, I want to recognize the work of Gabriela Grigorieva, um, who joined our team in January specifically to produce this event, who, who many of you have received emails from, who's absolutely brilliant at curating and organizing. Also, our institute manager, uh, Louise Ingledow, who has kept us calm and organized and focused. Um, and our colleagues in UAL Communications, including Kat Cooper and colleagues, um, and also the small team that came together to make the videos that I mentioned, including um, Adam Ravzi and Joe Thacker. And there's also a small team helping today, including um, our colleagues uh, Lynn Finn, Jocelyn Bailey, and some uh, students, including Adam, uh, Zwong, Alexis, Edlowit, um, our, our AV team, uh, Greymoth, um, the caterers, and the broader team at Chelsea. And I forgive me if I've forgotten anybody. And also, finally, my, my research fellow colleagues, uh, Patricia Kaczynska and Jocelyn Bailey, um, uh, put a lot of work into a working paper where we tried to map out some of the particularities around social design research. Um, I also want to acknowledge the work of the co-chairs. Uh, Alison is about to take over. So all of the co-chairs from the research centers and other parts of UAL who have worked with us to develop the program for today and um, engage with the speakers, as well as obviously thanking the speakers and you participants, both online and in the room. So thank you for making time for joining this event and contributing to it. We hope it's stimulating, challenging, and inspiring, um, and we all get to new understandings of practice research um, in design. And I'm now gonna hand over to Professor Alison Prenderville, who's chairing the first session. Thank you. So um, good morning and thank you for attending the session Definitions, Knowledge, Boundaries, Methods. Um, my name is Alison Prenderville. I'm Professor of Service Design at LCC, University of the Arts, London. Um, my design research is transdisciplinary, working with scientific experts in the area of zoonotic diseases, diagnostics and antimicrobial resistance in human and animal health systems, predominantly in India. Uh, central to my practice is the multiple social interactions with many different actors. Um, and the idea is that knowledge is co-created, analyzed and interacted, which I think came through in the discussions that were said, spoken about last evening. One of the key things I think to this approach is listening and humility. And I'm sure we'll have through this panel discussion today, some different uh, dimensions of practice research. I'd like to say it's a privilege to chair this session and already I've had some amazing conversations and truly inspiring short chats um, in corridors on telephones. So um, I'd like to actually start um, by inviting Anne Boddington, Emeritus Professor of Design and Innovation from Kingston University and very importantly, chair of the recently completed <laughs> Research Excellent Framework <laughs> sub-panel for Art and Design um, to give one example of something that makes practice research distinctive. Well, you might be surprised to say that I'm going to say it isn't distinctive. <laughs> um, and I'm going to start there because I think we have to have that conversation. Uh, I think practice is distinctive and I think research is distinctive. I think practice research is about a time, um, the time we're in. And I think Practice, practice research we should look at as a holding form for, uh, Harriet spoke about it last night, um, an expanded version of research. I think research is research, and I think practice is practice. And this is a, whole, this is a time when, uh, I was trying to think of an analogy this morning, but um, I think practice research is a bit like, we, we've known about black holes for a long time, and only last week we could photograph one. And when you can see it, it's a bit like what you can see, you can be. And I think we're in that moment where practice research is the holding form for us developing that technology that allows us mm -hmm. to build this kind of research and research that is perhaps beyond text um, into a bigger um, infrastructure for research. And I think that is really important. I'm going to make one more point, which I think is really critical, given what Indy said last night, um, is that I think that we've institutionalized research and we've institutionalized practice. The really big problem is that research is now seen as an elite and practice is seen as blue collar. And it's that bad. And I'm going to say that in, a, in you know, University of the Arts' biggest practice-based, probably, institution. But we don't have 
equal weight in both of those things. And that is partly at the core of the problem. And I'm going to probably leave it there. Thank you. So um, I'd like to follow on now with um, Dr. Kat uh, Jungnickel, a senior lecturer and researcher from the Department of Sociology at Goldsmiths University, with her practice situated within STS and feminist technoscience, using historical clothing tied to early uses of technology, such as bloomers and bikes, as a way to explore um, and, and inform new emergent technologies, citizenships and bodies. Over to you, Kat. Mm, thank you for the introduction. And thanks for the invite to speak. I think I have a different perspective on practice research, which is probably why I'm here. Um, I'm a sewing sociologist, um, which uh, usually then has to, I have to respond by then explaining what that is. Um, so I've been combining sewing and sociology for about a decade now in my research. I started during this ESRC funded project, Bikes and Bloomers, where I, um, my team and I remade a collection of convertible women's cycling clothes um, invented in the 1890s in response to women's um, restrictions to the freedom of movement. And I'll lead a European funded project called Politics of Patents that looks at 200 years of clothing inventions to better understand how inventors have just attempted to change things over time, how they've used new forms of clothing to disrupt or interrupt or just resist conventional kind of social beliefs and norms and in the process bring into being new forms of citizenship. So citizenship is just a massive topic right now and it arguably always has and certainly has been a topic for sociologists for a very long time. But it can seem like a really difficult and impenetrable thing to kind of get into and discuss. So we're trying, I'm bringing, I hope, with my practice research, different ways and different perspectives into it. So um, yes, I look at, I bring sociology, STS and feminist technoscience and I think of clothing as socio-technical devices that enable, constrain and organise bodies in different ways. And at POP, we get really up close to this subject area. We're using inventive methods to study inventions. So I do what I term um, speculative sewing, which is um, it involves stitching together data, theory, methods and fabric into the clothing described by inventors in their inventions, in their patents. And then we analyse these as three-dimensional arguments. Um, so we follow inventors step-by-step -step instructions to reconstruct clothes no longer in existence and it's much easier to say that sometimes than actually do it. Um, but in the process of doing this, I, we, I believe that it enables us to think with, through and actually in the research. Like we talk about material, materiality a lot and embodiment a lot in sociology but actually here I kind of, like I'm actually in the research talking about it. And in that process, we ask new and different questions of data. We spend time with inventors, dwelling with them, especially ones that have long since passed. And I talk about it as I'm interviewing people through their inventions. And so lots of things emerge from this that I will, will talk a little bit more about in this session. But overall, what comes to me is that we often end up answering questions, answering things that we didn't even think to ask at the beginning of the project. And that's what I think is to answer the question is distinctive about the practice research that I'm doing within the discipline of sociology. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Patricia Kazinska as a senior research fellow at the Social Design Institute and as a research associate in culture at King's College London with your recent paper on practice research and de design. Where would you see um, an example of something that makes practice research unique? Uh, many thanks, Alison. I'm so glad to be on this panel. Fascinating. What I'm going to say will probably sound a bit dry, but uh, I'm a philosopher. Uh, my apologies. Anyway, all of you would have read the working paper and uh, so you'll know that uh, what makes practice research uh, distinctive is that it's uh, situational, situated and situating. <clears throat> Let me rehearse. It's uh, uh, situational in the sense that uh, it's carried out in situations through transformation. It's situated because it's a network uh, knowledge production aware of its past and it's situating uh, because it contributes to existing stock of knowledge and engages in something we call ontological transformation. So basically, if you apply all of these three uh, to uh, whatever you are interested in, you, have, uh, con you can be confident that what will come out is practice research. But now, is it distinctive? Hmm. So if by distinctive you mean categorically different, I think that probably all research to a um, minimum uh, degree has characteristics of the three S's. Uh, if there's a spectrum, and if you start with like armchair uh, philosophy, 
kind of deep thinking, a priori reasoning. I don't know, the kind of reasoning that people tell you does not make uh, connections with experiences. For instance, to know uh, if uh, all bachelors are unmarried men, I don't need to go out there and meet bachelors. I kind of know because it definitely follows. So if you start on, with this on one end of the spectrum, then on the other end of the spectrum, you will have like uh, truly uh, uh, triple S practice research. And for me, that probably would will be the sort of performative research carried out by uh, Roger Nibon or the uh, inventive type of uh, research uh, from Leonardo, both mentioned yesterday. Why? Because those uh, ways of acquiring knowledge uh, seriously uh, tackle the resistance of the material physical world out there. So um, yeah, that's my example. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I think all of this feeds into um, the next question, but also from the conversations that were had last night. Um, what ways of understanding of practice research are emerging? Um, Anne, would you like to reflect on that? What ways are emerging? Mm. I, think, I think what we're what we're trying to get to is is to find ways of actually capturing. I, I think the capture is much more critical. I think we've been doing this kind of research forever. I don't, I don't think it's new at all. What we're trying to find is a name in order that we can do something about it. And that's why I said it's that, it's that form of capture. And we've now, probably for the first time, I mean, we were in, in the audience whispering naughtily when we were supposed to be listening um, uh, last night, which was which was really, we've been talking about this, I mean, I've been talking about it for at least 30 years, um, and it's a long, long, long time. But I think now, and, and that's the exciting thing about this moment, is that we need to find the means to make this searchable, discoverable, that we build the body of knowledge, which we still don't, really have, and that's why if you look at the Prague report, which I think this is where the paper was, or what the paper was generated from, is that we now, now probably have the technology to try and do some of that. But, but the questions I think we have to answer is the questions of research integrity more broadly, which are, what do we mean by re reproducibility in research? What do we mean by replicability in research? What do we mean? Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting to talk about embodiment, but that's not new. That, if you're in social sciences rather than arts, you, you've been doing that for a long, long time. Or if you're an anthropologist, sociologist. So none of that is new. What we can do, though, is to think about the technologies that we need to bring that to bear and to make it searchable and discoverable in the world. And I think that's where... We, we need to focus our energies, and we we might be we might be dangerously worried about definition when actually we need to get from where we are now to just saying this is research, and that we can fill that kind of like photographing the black hole. We can fill that space, and that we just become researchers like everybody else. And that might be disappointing, but I think it's actually it should be something we really celebrate. Thank you, Kat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, in so many ways, you know, lots of this is not new in social science as well, but it also um, hasn't necessarily been recognised or appreciated, nor has there been a space for it to actually fit in many things, such as journal articles or in presentations or even in sociology offices. So I was making some notes about this because I was thinking I've been um, doing practice research for a very long time it, before I knew what it was that I was actually doing or that I was allowed to do or I had any ability to actually articulate it. Um, I did a conventionally written PhD in sociology. Um, so while my practice didn't officially count, it wasn't recognised, it wasn't in the PhD, it was nevertheless really important for me kind of coming up with this kind of knowledge. Um, but and, but sociology has changed a lot since then and it has a long way to go still. And we certainly um, have been very fortunate through luck and hard work to find myself in the department that I've been in. I've been there for a decade or more. Um, and because it's been quite porous to different disciplines, to actually learn from, to collaborate from, to think about the language that's used in different places and the practices, and to um, just build on what we've been thinking about is what is practice research. And also um, my department, um, the people in it, it just turned out to be just actually incredible and open to different kinds of ways of doing social sciences. 
Um, for, as an example, you know, my department didn't even bat an eye when I started to make a lot of mess becoming a social sewing social scientist. Um, as you'd imagine, sociology officers are not really equipped for sewing as research. Um, it was only when pins were found in the lift that um, I was moved out of the main building um, and into a different, more expansive and contained space. Um, but still, it was still just seen, it was still recognised as being kind of sociology within that department. And I know that's not across, you know, everywhere, but it was just a very good formative space. So finding your space and creating those spaces to actually generate and build confidence, I think, has been incredibly important for me within this kind of... Um, discipline. But more broadly, there's a lot of practice research and there has been for a very long time in science and technology studies. More recently, it's labelled as making and doing projects, but has a longer history in the field of science studies and the histories of technology, and I draw on a lot of that in my work. Um, and as I said, practice has always been integral to what I do. And I recently edited a book um, called Transmissions, Critical Tactics for Making and Communicating Research. And in it, in it, 15 of us argued that practice is not just a method, which is one way also it sometimes gets a bit kind of contained within some of the social sciences. We argued that actually it is theory and methods and modes in which you share, show and involve and engage others with the work. Like it is part of everything that you do. Um, and what I just personally really find valuable about practice research is not only how it kind of generates unique knowledge in my own practice, but also just how far it travels. I was thinking, and the kind of different work it does, and the different people that get invited into things, um, because it, I've just been thinking about kind of previous work in the current project. I think the practice research that I do invite people in that otherwise might not be interested in dusty old dry, you know, historic patterns or in sociological arguments, but they're interested in the costumes that I make. And through that, we can talk about kind of difficult or complicated or, you know, kind of intimate ideas. Um, and just an, ex as an example of this, um, we made a collection of PDF sewing patterns inspired by the patterns that we then made the costumes from. Um, and they've been downloaded like tens of thousands of times from the project's website um, by people around the world. And they make these clothes, send me pictures of them, comment on them, translating them and interpreting the research again and again on their own bodies, which just keeps on building and growing and totally surprising in ways in a way that um, sometimes a journal article does different types of work, but this is, again, just a thicker and quite exciting. Thank you. And Patricia. Wish there was something we're gonna disagree about, but uh, <laughs> not uh, not this time. I, mean, I, I too feel that it's not emergent, but uh, maybe I'll add to what uh, um, the previous speaker said. It's suppressed. It has been suppressed. Mm. So uh, one of the points we're making in the uh, working paper is that um, uh, practice research has suffered from. Uh, epistemic injustice or violence, that's uh, um, Miranda's Fricker's uh, term, but effectively what it means is that we don't have uh, the kind of right concepts uh, to, uh, uh, to talk about it, to express it, to articulate, to communicate, and effectively that yes, the um, representational uh, research uh, probably uh, is like uh, four centuries ahead of uh, practice research, I mean since enlightenment people have been uh, working around the concepts and uh, techniques. So um, that's that's the first point to make. Uh, if uh, exciting ways to talk about practice research. So once again, going back to philosophy, um, philosophers are not so good at practicing practice research, but uh, have been trying to talk about it. And I think some of the ways are promising, even though not that new. For instance, uh, Gilbert Ryle in the uh, 1920s when he first encountered Heidegger, came up with this uh, knowing how and knowing that distinction, mm -hmm. and then uh, immediately decided that they were really not uh, dis distinctive and distinct. Uh, so there's a work happening right now. Uh, for instance, uh, Tim Williamson, Jason Stanley in the US, uh, they are saying how uh, to, to know how and know that, uh, you need to have both. Yeah, you cannot mm. do one uh, without the other. And this is also, you find this in Chomsky. Uh, Chomsky talks about uh, language uh, in those terms. And it was interesting, it's like he really makes it about knowledge, not about an ability. Like for instance, like uh, if I, uh, I, knew, I, I can know uh, how to speak a language or I, have, I can know how to swim, 
but uh, I might not be able to. For instance, if I was paralyzed, I would still have that knowledge, but, but it would not be an ability. So there's a kind of interesting nuance here. If we are interested in knowledge, I think uh, there's something happening uh, there. And um, link with design. So I've, I've been uh, obsessed, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Lucy and Joss, will know, with this guy in Oxford, Luciano Floridi, who is a philosopher of information. I've been obsessed with him because he's talking about the kind of the big paradigm shift and, and the need for uh, logic of design. And he says explicitly that designing is not a form of empirical experimenting but a distinctive epistemic praxis uh, through which one gains a uh, maker's knowledge. So what, what the hell is this maker's knowledge? I, I'm not sure I fully understand yet, but there's, there's decisively kind of making intervention into uh, the information system and having the system uh, transform as a result and they're effectively not being an outside uh, point uh, into that. Uh, it probably relates to Herbert Simon's logic of discovery and uh, the logic of invention as well, um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's slightly different. So I, I would say that, yeah, philosophy, in fact, does give us some interesting terms to start unpacking or interrogating practice research uh, that do not fall back on tacit knowing, because tacit knowing, the way Indy said, is like, a bit of you know passive. What we need is like active mm. uh, verbs to uh, go and do the work. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. In fact, um, this leads on very nicely to our video where we have a presentation from Dr. Leslie Ann Knoll, who is assistant professor in the Department of Design Studies at North Carolina State University. And in Leslie Ann's video, she actually um, gives a very personal account of this struggle in terms of how do you articulate. What you do and how do we understand actually um, what our practice is and 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 how we represent that so um, in terms of um, we're going to turn to the screen now um, we'll have Leslie Ann's um, contribution hello uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of this conversation uh, my name is Leslie Ann Noel, and I'm an assistant professor at North Carolina State University in the Department of Art and Design and within the Design Studies Unit. So um, you've asked quite a few difficult questions and I'll get into them. And maybe my answer won't be what you're expecting. Uh, I need to start off this video by acknowledging that maybe I do not practice research in design or research through design, um, and maybe I do something else. And why do I start there? Um, when I was a PhD student, I applied to the um, DRS's PhD by design conversation, and I was rejected. <laughs> with a remark saying, thank you for your interest, but you are not doing research through design. So over the years, I've really had to reflect about which preposition I'm using in the design research that I do, um, because I still think that I do design research. So some of the, the questions that I might ask, or you know, the way I think about the preposition, I ask myself, Am I doing research through design, research about design, research with design? Am I researching who designs, how we design, why we design, when design happens, where design happens, what is design? Um, am I doing research? Uh, you know, am I a designer doing research or a researcher interested in design? You know, that kind of question actually happened after that rejection that said I wasn't doing um, design research that could join the PhD colloquium. So, um, you know, and some more questions like, am I doing research, as I said, about design? Am I using design to do research? Am I doing practice-based or practice-led design research? And perhaps the biggest question of all, do all of these different variations even matter? So, um, you know, I may view research in a very traditional way. As a designer, I'm pretty sure that my design experience ex informs the way that I iterate on the research question and the way that I plan the research execution, but also influenced 
um, perhaps by where I did my PhD um, studies, the way I view research um, is framed by, you know, sometimes very specific methods and paradigms. Um, you know, what makes design research and maybe what makes design research distinctive? Uh, for me, design research can take many forms. Um, the designer can do research through making. The research can be designed, can be done by designers or researchers who are other researchers who are just interested in design. You know, and it could be questions about who designs, why they design, how is um, design different when it's done in dif by different people and in different contexts. And you know, obviously, the questions that I ask are informed by you know who I am, my positionality, my life experience, et cetera. So a different designer might be asking completely different questions. Um, there are many different elements in the design process and the research can be conducted um, about all of these. You know, for example, the designers, the users, the process or processes and the methods, the design artifacts, and even the impact. So after years of reflection, and since that DRS rejection, um, and I didn't maintain any bad feelings for the DRS, obviously, because I'm very active in the organization still. Um, I'm not sure that I do practice research in design. I am perhaps more of a designer who does research and borrows from different methods and other um, disciplines. And I kind of cobble together specific ways of working that are informed by my design background. Um, designly, designerly ways of working are um, pragmatist. So perhaps when a designer borrows from other disciplines, we do so in a pragmatist way. And the research that I'm currently doing is related to education and public health, um, but I'm using designly ways of thinking, making, and doing. Um, what might make design research that I'm associated with distinctive is the creative and and iterative methods um, that I bring into the process. Um, as I said, my research focuses on education, public health, and then another area that I'm in is civic and social innovation. And I collaborate with people from other disciplines, but bring design methods, um, tools, and um, into the process. Um, for example, in the education and public health work, there's a lot of making and there are many visual prompts and visual reflections. Um, and the process is more experiential and more experimental than the educators and the public health researchers um, may be used to in other contexts. In the social innovation research and projects, we're leading cities and residents through the design process to understand and create responses to social issues that affect um, these places. And there's a lot more iterative um, problem framing, ideation, prototyping, and critique than these people are accustomed to using. How can we make sense of the intersections with other forms of practice um, research? You know, with regard to making sense of the intersections with other forms of practice research, for me, this is the most exciting part. I love design, but I don't want to talk with designers all day. Um, so my own work deepened and developed as I was able to understand how qualitative researchers in the social sciences engage with their positionality and social justice issues um, in general. And I've brought that into my design work. Um, I, in another, um, at another time, I worked for about a year with a colleague in dance, and it's hard to articulate the impact, but the leading and following action in dance has changed the way that I think about leadership, you know, and even creativity and experimentation, you know, and while perhaps not a social science, I've been very interested in how people write about food and how people learn to cook, and I've been bringing that into my design research and practice as well. The challenge in the intersection is, I suppose, how this work is evaluated. Um, when I work with my colleague in pu public health, it's difficult for us to publish because the work is not designerly enough, it's not public healthy enough. And um, these are the typical struggles of people who do interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work. But the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary work is in fact most exciting to me. I don't actually know if we have to make sense of it. And, um, you know, maybe I'm leaving some questions for you to think about. Do we need these rigid definitions about what is design research or can we open it up 
and just say, well, let's research about design. It doesn't have to be, you know, we don't have to be using these specific um, prepositions, research through design or et cetera. So thank you. Hope you all have a great forum. I should just add also that Levnian is also a co-convener co for the DRS Tour Reversal Design Special Interest Group and as a, as a plug, but also there's a great paper that she's uh, produced, uh, the design of uh, designing a world of many centers. It's downloadable. Do, if any of you haven't read it, uh, access it. Um, and picking up on what Levnian was saying about how, you know, do we need these definitions and also this importance of the interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, the joy of working with the um, a different um, uh, subject specialisms, um, how can we make sense of the intersection between design with other forms of research such as uh, social sciences and other humanities? Yes. <laughs> I think, well, I would, I'd like to build on what Indy was saying a little bit last night, which is about, which if, you take, if you talk about interdisciplinarity, there are two bits to it, really. One is... Uh, understanding discipline and I I'm a great I'm a great lover of discipline in, in a sense and I think one of the things Indy was saying last night about um, about Ford bringing together the best minds mm. I think we do need to bring together the best minds um, but if we talk about if we talk about design research or we talk about um, practice uh, uh, what we're talking about <laughs> practice research you need brilliant practice and you need brilliant research. And one of the things that's very difficult in this is, and this is why I'm so worried about devaluing practice and <coughs> making research some kind of elite practice. And that is so dangerous. You've got to have high quality practice. We don't recognize that in our universities anymore. We recognize everybody will go in and, and go in for promotion. And I won't do this, but I'm tempted to say, is there any professor of practice in this room? A professor that got their professorship on the basis of practice. Because everybody will claim that they got their research, their research as their professorship. And that is precisely the point I mean in an institution that is a practice-based institution in every sense of the word. And we must value that. And we must also value um, research. And not everybody that does research needs, not everybody that does practice needs to do research. And we don't need to conflate the two. And I think once we know that, we know what good research looks like in practice. And I'm not saying there isn't any. But the thing that holds all those together is scholarship. We all need to, we all need to study and do and make and practice in one sense or another. And I think bringing those two things together is then much easier, provided we understand quality and recognize and reward quality on both sides. The other part of that, which is, and it's really lovely to hear somebody say, we've, you know, we're bringing together sociology and, and arts practice or design practice. And the, but the really important thing is then the hospitality of the other disciplines you're working with. So the other bit that really matters in this is not that we are decorative appendages to science, which is often, uh, frankly, how we're presented, is that we must be an equal and quality part of both of those things. And so that is really critical, is that we have equal respect, uh, recognition and reward in, that, in the sense of bringing all forms of practice, but also all forms of discipline together and interdisciplinarity can only really happen when those two things come together and that's a both political challenge um, it's also a practical challenge in how those things are recognized you know and, and the pins in the lift is a classic example you know you know you're not welcome it's a health and safety issue or it's a risk um, and we're all in that sense at threat because those spaces to, to bring those things together and to make a mess and to experiment and to perhaps find the question at the end of the practice rather than at the beginning um, are all part of actually recognizing um, how different, different practices, if you like, come together in that context. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant, wasn't it? Um, apologies. Yeah, a helpful one. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, that was that was really interesting um, because I'm just trying to then think about how, as I have been doing and, and always doing this, because how sociology um, and practice research kind of like what is this in this context of design? To, to be honest, I very rarely um, used to even use the word design because I just found it a bit scary. You know, <laughs> I just I just thought I was uh, I was a sociologist. You know, I happened to do what I thought of was practice research, but I just uh, didn't quite know where it fitted in this kind of this particular kind of canon. So I can only speak to, of course, you know, my experience of the ways in which we're doing practice research within sociology, and I can definitely say for certain that. We we take a very nerdy approach to it. Um, we love a method in sociology and we love a couple of research questions. Um, uh, I don't think that comes as a surprise. Um, but it often means that we, we often start, you know, our research from, um, you know, having a kind of a research framework and a series of at least draft questions of which to then go and enter into, you know, um, the incredible treasure which is in a patent archive. Um, and we also like to use, and I was thinking again about this, the, you know, classic um, sociological imagination, which I'm sure quite a few of you are familiar with this. You know, it's the 1950s, you know, C. Wright Mills idea of linking the very smaller personal um, uh, with the larger social world. And I also do quite a lot of time traveling with my sociological imagination in the archives, because it goes back to 1820, um, in order to relate today's social and political issues and problems to things happening and concerning people, you know, over 100 years ago and vice versa. And so what I think that I try to do with kind of my theory and my practice all kind of wrapped up together is to put it into dialogue with each other across time and across place and across these different materials. Um, and approaches. Um, and and I, as I was writing this, I was thinking it makes it sound a bit like you've kind of got it all set in place before you get started. And it's certainly not like that. You know, having a, a kind of a, a sense of your theoretical framework or your questions doesn't mean you don't get surprised by your research or you're not investigating. Um, but it does help to kind of guide through. And I often say to my students when they go off on amazing tangents, um, that is super interesting, but is it important? You know, how does this relate to kind of something? Why, you know, why would you keep kind of pursuing in those different directions? It's kind of a tough and terrible thing to answer, but I think it's also kind of a way of which to kind of hold on to, um, and, you know, without getting, you know, lost or overwhelmed. Um, and, um, you know, patents, as I said, can be incredibly, um, uh, you know, they're full of treasure, the patent archives, um, because um, they provide, and this is when I started to talk more about design, you know, because I'm looking at design patents, and the inventors are providing, you know, incredible glimpses into particular socio-cultural context of the um, context of the time, as well as providing step-by-step -step instructions for future users to replicate their ideas to resolve particular problems. So they're amazing. I think they're such a fantastic kind of mix of social science and design there because they, they identify a problem, then they tell you how to solve it in these kind of material ways. Um, and of course, clothes are, are so kind of pressed in intimately to our bodies. In order to understand them, I was making the argument that we cannot just read about these things or look at the pictures. We actually have to get much closer to these things. And there is an intimacy in, in wearing the clothes of others, you know, in this context. So in this experience so far, this process has been quite illuminating. Um, and for me, sociology and design practice research brings, if I can say that, brings so many different perspectives, sensory engagements, time periods, links to contemporary issues. It really thickens the data for me. And as I said, I think about these objects as being three-dimensional arguments um, and helps me explore how and in what ways the past might help us navigate the present and imagine kind of different futures. And Tracy, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. I'm having a moment of panic because I'm applying the super interesting, but is it important to the kind of things <laughs> I care about? And, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm wondering. Like, it's, it, it's a good one, though. Uh, anyway, the yes, intersections with the humanities. I'll take the humanities because that's that's the kind of one thing I I can broadly speak to. So what, what is what is what is the humanities? It's obviously a bunch of uh, disciplines. Uh, rolled into one, I think what they have in common is preoccupation with meaning making. So it's not about uh, uh, verifiability, it's about hermeneutics, it's about interpretations. And the problem with the humanities has been that people, um, I don't know if they, anyone seriously ever thought that, but maybe uncritically assumed that there were, that meaning was in the head, that uh, a humanities was something done by, uh, and that's a quote, uh, symbol wielding uh, animals and that like, the way people relate to the world is through this theater of representations in the head, right? But um, I think 
over the last uh, 50, 70 years, people have become much more preoccupied with the mechanisms of uh, uh, meaning making. And this is where the intersection with uh, practice research and design um, becomes much more apparent. So I, I want to focus on two specific points of convergence. Uh, first, it's uh, warranted assertability. So this is the kind of standard of validity you, you get in the humanities. You cannot go and uh, you know check whether something is true against the facts in the world. It's not objective, but neither is it just like a subjective opinion. There's something that makes uh, some claims valid, but not all, and it's about effectively going out there and talking to people in specific situations and having a warranted acceptance that uh, the claim is true. And I think the, 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 this, the same applies to practice research. That's what uh, practice research can aspire to. And in, and in fact, it's good enough. Um, and this leads another, another thing that kind of directly related are thick descriptions, um, which I think relate to uh, sociological imaginaries a little. But once again, uh, Gilbert Ryle, uh, strangely came up with this term that then later got uh, adopted by uh, Gertz uh, and others. But thick descriptions effectively is, uh, is a view that in order to understand the situation, you cannot just uh, describe it from the point of view of the observer, the third point view, but you also have to uh, give the account uh, from the first person perspective of the actor. So uh, in order to make sense of something, the, the two have to come together. And uh, I think yet again, that in order to crack uh, practice research, uh, uh, you need that, and this is where the humanities and practice research come together. So uh, intersubjective validity and thick descriptions is where hum the humanities and uh, practice research converge. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, so we're about to move on to our second video, which is uh, has been provided by um, Cameron Tonkinwise, Professor of Design Studies and Research Director of Design Innovation Centre at the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. Um, Again, he's produced a really beautiful summary on the social aspects of social design. And um, the video is um, slightly longer than our previous one, but I think you'll enjoy it. And again, it will hopefully stimulate questions and discussion. Hello, and apologies for not being with you for this important event. And apologies for not facing you I'm in the middle of a preventative skin cancer treatment, and so I look not unlike the singing detective. Most practice research in design seems implicitly, since it most certainly is more often cited than actually read, uh, informed by Michael Pagliani's little book, The Tacit Dimension. The argument of the book is that there are many skills that people have, whether everyday skills like recognizing a friend in a crowd, or technical skills like being able to make a visual communication design feel resolved, that people have difficulty explaining the mechanics of. Their actions have the surety and reliability that suggests that they are following a complicated rule, but they can nevertheless never articulate what that rule is. The way these skills resist explicitation or explication means that to teach these skills, for example, to teach people how to do this or that kind of designing, requires a combination of immersion in the skilled practice so that they can gain a feel for the whole practice, doing the practice by imitating experts, doing parts of the practice and then combining them in more complex, less scaffolded settings over time, and being subject to continuous crit, something that is internalized so that reflective practitioners self-regulate the feeling of combining actions into a good performance of the skill. Good models of practice research, and I have most experience for almost two decades now with RMIT's practice-based design research PhDs, replicate this version of design education. Researchers undertake a series of projects, and not just one project, progressively exploring new forms or domains of design practice. In addition to supervision, they are subject to twice yearly external reviews, which act like design research crit, helping candidates articulate what their practice and or practice outcomes seem to demonstrate, and therefore what they should next experiment with or test. And an exhibit, deliberately not called by RMIT anymore an exhibition, of their projects and progressive articulations of what new practices or understandings of a context have been developed that are then shared with other practitioners, 
meaning practice-based research is also practice-oriented research. What is exemplary about this model of practice research is that it foregrounds the social epistemology of design research. There is a tension in design between the studio, a comparatively isolated space for design ideation and detailing, and the wider social, and by social I mean non or at least only ever indirect stakeholders in what is being designed. So I don't mean the clients, customers and users of this or that design, but rather delegates of the practice in general and of the impacts on society resulting from how designing happens. In design education, that kind of social is brought into the studio in the form of the studio leader and other students who are not yet designers. But in practice, this is less the case unless the practice is very diligent about external peer crit and collaborative design. Practice research, therefore, returns the social to designing, which is what it allows it to be new knowledge or know-how generating and, and not just expert practice. I have in, in my chapter in Lorene's book on the previous page likened this to the idea of lay peer review in post-normal science and deliberative citizen juries in technology impact assessments. Now, the situation is very different in social design. Designers working in community-centered ways or on social challenges should have, according to the emerging ethos of co-design, little or no studio component meaning designer-driven component, to their practice. Design, when everyone designs, and I'm here following the arguments of Ezio Manzini, is about being very much in service to the social, never designing for a targeted group of people, but rather, wherever possible, facilitating designing by, beyond designing, with communities. In the early stages of collaborations, the designer's task is merely distilling the community's ideas, materializing them in ways that help the community build something out of them, what Etio calls sense-making. And in the later stages of collaborations, the designer's task is merely to make social innovations more accessible, robust, and or less effortful. At the most, facilitating the translation of social innovations into forms that other communities might adopt, which was the methodology of the DESIS projects. It should therefore not really be possible to get a PhD in social design because the community is the one that has done the researching and the designing, developing not just ideas but materialising transformed social practices. So perhaps at best there should be practice, research, social design PhDs given to communities. In this context, the practice of, of research in social design might in fact be about returning the studio to the social rather than the other way around, which also means returning the researcher as an individual or as a group as outsiders to the practice. To explain this, I'll return to Pogliani, but to his larger philosophy of science contribution, personal knowledge. This book talks about the work that the researcher does to develop a conviction that the findings of their research should be considered knowledge. The arguments suffer these days from having been displaced in part by Bruno Latour and Steve Woolgar's laboratory life, though Pogliani draws more attention to the psychological, if not existential, side of that conviction. Knowing, and not just coming to know, is portrayed by him as a practice, in fact, as a kind of connoisseurship, one in which the individual knower is a vital agent. The knower is in one sense external to the abstract status of knowledge, but on the other hand, there is no knowledge without its detour through the one who knows, knowing here being an action and not a state. In social design, perhaps that external personal perspective brought to the project in the form of the researcher brings doubt rather than conviction. Research is added to a community's initiatives, which is something very different to research of these initiatives. The researcher is generating alternatives against which to test the community's designs. The privilege of most university-backed social design practice research is then to make a difference to, not just accelerate or solidify, the social work of community-centred projects. 
Communities are the source of innovation to challenges neglected by governments and markets. I'm, I'm recalling Ezio's uh, thesis here. They have lived experience of those challenges, and if resourced, they know what is needed in response. Uh, Ezio calls them pioneers in that sense. But there are three dangers here. Communities may be subject to groupthink problem frames, ones that are the result of decades of oppression that is at risk of being reproduced even in successful responses to those problems. So the researcher might in fact bring problem reframing to the community. Secondly, the challenge in most cases is to transition the system rather than just let the community find tolerable ways of being resilient within an unchanged system. Transitioning invariably involves, according to transition design, coordinating with change making in areas initially far from the problem domains at hand, connecting these up to create new pathways. And finally, systems level change requires working not only with those aware of the need for change, because they directly suffer neglect by governments or markets, for example, but also with those not currently impacted and so often resistant to change. Consequently, the job of social design research should be to work on what is beyond the remit of the community currently centred by a project. The researcher's challenge is to bring in other communities, other perspectives, other possibilities. And this should be practice research in that it is designed to enable change, not just provoke epiphenomenally. I'm not meaning here art-like provocations, but precisely designs, able to be evaluated on the extent to which they have worked, in this case, in shifting what the community doing the social design knows. The personal component, or rather the component that might come from outside the particular social of any social design, in the form of social design practice researchers, would involve a change in what a community knows about their situation. Practice research in social design is an opportunity to challenge what particular communities know and know how to do, opening them to transition pathways beyond the immediacy of any social problem solving they're currently undertaking. The design studio of the practice researcher should be a source of critical perspectives that cause the community to change what they know. The designer brings convictions about other transition pathways to the social design project. I do not mean this to be sort of hero-like saviouring. These are experiments at change that would of course be critically validated by the peer review of the university, and, and such experiments might have negative results when the studio practice and the researchers fail to redirect the community for any number of reasons, and not succeeding in opening communities to other kinds of transitions would still be important research findings. I hope this helps you in your debate around definitions of social design practice research. Our final question actually really asks, where will we be talking about practice research in design in 10 years' time? Um, Anne, would you like to... I yeah. <laughs> in a sense, I don't mean that. I mean, in, all, in all seriousness, I think the really important thing, which is, I think, is that it will be more recognised. It will be of an equivalence to any other form of research, because that's what it is. And that we, my my will, my real wish is that alongside that we still recognise the brilliant practice for what it is. Probably, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, as a sociologist, you know, we constantly look for patterns of things and kind of always say that things never kind of go away or get resolved; they just get reproduced yeah. and you know in different ways. So and, um, I was thinking about this and just thinking that uh, as much as lots of things change, um, uh, lots of things uh, lots of things change, lots of things also stay the same. And there's lots of changes in all the available tech. And from a sociological perspective, there's more, you know, um, there's more interest and skills that people are bringing to their scholarship. Um, 
And of course, um, there's so much interdisciplinary teaching that's happening now. And although there's kind of far fewer grants out there than I would wish there were, there's, I think, support and growing awareness for this kind of thing and getting, um, getting encouraged. So I was thinking that um, I pretty much hid practice research in my ESRC grant um, in 2013, um, but I didn't hide it in my ERC one. Um, and actually getting that provided kind of recognition for me um, in the fact that this kind of strange uh, approach to sociology was, uh, was okay. Um, and you shouldn't have to wait for a kind of grant to get that, but it kind of certainly has enabled me um, to um, kind of generate capacity in sewing practices um, in social sciences. Um, and um, when we were talking about this yesterday, which I found really, really um, great, actually I'm just finding it really nice to see lots of people actually and having conversations <laughs> in person. Um, but um, the, the POP project is not just about archives and past inventors, we've also been uh, interviewing contemporary inventors who are using clothing to make changes, to make small shifts in different things, to change the world in some way, whether it's modest or humble or just stitch by stitch. And it was an absolute joy to talk with inventors about their inventions during the bulk of all the lockdowns. Um, because despite everything, and maybe because of it, people are incredibly inventive. You know, um, and given what the last decade has delivered and, and then the many issues that are facing us now, um, uh, and I was listing a few of them, and I'm just not going to, because we all know, you know, all of them. I think we need all the research tools and, and the, you know, the advancement on all the research tools and all the diversity and the capacities that they bring in different disciplines that we can muster. And I think also, I kind of read you know, this question about will we still be talking about it? Um, you know, I think, yes, we are talking about it, but also what's evident here and um, is that we're also doing it in so many kind of different ways. Um, and I find that really exciting. And I hope that we will be talking more about it because it just shows that we are sharing and um, in collaboration and learning from each other. Thank you. Well, I, I do hope we'll be talking about it in the next 10 months because now following Cameron's paper, uh, there's a sequel on social design, um, a practice research in social design. But uh, in 10 years, hopefully not in 10, in 10 years, I think in 10 years there will be uh, less talking, more practicing. I mean, especially if like talking means like the need to justify and legitimize. I, I hope we, I, I think it's likely we'll be in a different place because those things are sinusoidal. Like we are going through a uh, pragmatic uh, infatuation with, uh, um, practice research. Um, uh, so, but I, I do hope that just to kind of go back to the panel yesterday that uh, we will not absorb everything now and pour the baby out with the bathwater. That in 10 years from now we'll kind of have on the same footing the kind of the logic of uh, representation, the manipulation of symbols. We need that, but at the same time we also need the logic of discovery, the logic of design, and like most importantly, I think we'll we'll have more like ethics of care. I think what, the nice thing that comes with uh, practice research is this kind of opening up uh, to uh, um, the cringe-worthy reality uh, rather than putting it in a kind of straight jacket of categories. You actually need to engage, and if you engage, and if you are not a sociopath, you'll react differently. <laughs> That's a good way to finish. <laughs> I would just like to add, because I have so enjoyed listening to um, the, three, the three and also um, the two videos, that something that strikes me about my own research, but also um, from your own reflections, is this, this social aspect. And when I work with scientists, their practice is very much, they have their own practice in the labs. But actually, that very rarely, it will go out of the lab in a journal paper. But actually, in terms of getting the the public and communities to really engage in very complex topics, which they want to do in a way actually which is very equitable and is an endeavor of sort of discovery for them is actually that's really doesn't come through in some other disciplines. So when we talk about practice research for us, and I think Kat, when you were talking about that rich description that people taking their own initiative to send you back images is that really personal involvement in research, which you don't necessarily have within some of the more in the scientific discipline. So um, I, that, all the questions have been answered, and now we turn to the audience to actually have uh, your questions to the panel.
Good, mo good morning. My name is Nina Tortola. I teach at the, I'm a graphic design lecturer and a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Edinburgh Napier, originally from Finland, but now living in Scotland. Um, I would like to ask this, um, we're talking about practice. Where is the practice? I really miss, I'm, I want to see something, I want to feel something. And now we're talking about it, I would like to see it as well. Thank you. turn up at events in my practice <laughs> so I thought about it this morning and and obviously sometimes well obviously very often I'm the only sociologist wearing their research when I turn up at conferences um, and I can overheat in it depending on how things are you know um, air conditioned um, so I, I do do that partly as a provocation for you know kind of getting up close to and um, and partly because the performative aspect it's very rich on many layers for me it can it can it can, it can malfunction it can be embarrassing, it can overheat, but it's is also um, inviting for conversations and interactions and delight, you know, and forces me to like pick up my game quite a lot because then I'm actually performing my research and that language again is comes with a whole you know baggage of theory and history and and I'm not a performer so what am I doing with all of these? So I find it very rich and challenging and difficult and great, but often I do that. Um, I've suggested that there's a spectrum. So effectively, what you have witnessed today is me practice. I'm sorry if it's not like you know more fireworks, but uh, yeah. I don't mean fireworks, but the actual visual, visualization of the design is is something. And one of the things I think that's happened in design is is a kind of move away. I, you know, it, with a different hat on, I um, part of the design council. Um, trustee, board of trustees, and one of the things that you see is the, the newest framework is systemic design. Mm -hmm. It has no mm -hmm. visual in the same way that we have visuals in graphic design or in practice, fashion practice. So we, I think, our expectations of what design research is in all of those, and indeed what design practice is. And, and one of the, I mean, one of the things I. I got increasingly frustrated with is that when we're trying to explain what design is or rather what design does is that we end up saying design is everything which I think is the worst place to be we've got to say actually design does this and it does it really well and then and then there are other things, and design and innovation get conflated, conflated design and invention get infla conflated and we end up not being as clear. But doesn't as we it go could back be. to that we need to define the terms? Like, what is it? What does it actually mean? Because I understand from philosophy. I mean, I work actually in artistic research, but I, I use philosophy. I use literature theories. I work as a contemporary conceptual artist. I relate to the MoMA exhibitions, uh, Tate Modern, Jade Britain exhibitions. I relate to graphic design, but graphic design is more like a methodology of thinking visually. So that's why I'm asking. I mean, we're still not only philosophers, except if you are. But there is something, something that we're producing, because isn't that the practice, or maybe that's not? But, but to come to the point earlier, is it useful? I mean, is it, is it helping you in that context? And I think that's the question. And, and I think, you know, we've got to think, we've got to think through those, those sorts of uh, contexts rather than say, well, I want to see it. Sometimes we can't, and sometimes it is you know, a mental process, sometimes it's a practice process. I, and that's why I think being clear about research and being clear about practice is quite helpful in the sense that we can identify one in the other. I think you make a good point, but basically distinguishing what, 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 I, what I talk about is practice research. Practice research in design, I think, is yet another category, if you like. <laughs> so. Um, hi, my name is Mitali from the Royal College of Art. Um, my question is, uh, well, I'll start with this, which is academic institutions encourage multidisciplinarity. Um, and wh what is considered practice research in design? Uh, it's kind of inspired from Leslie's point of what's the point? Uh, I'm using design, but I'm also using other disciplines. How do you define that? What is the boundary? So are boundaries created as a part of reinstating institutional power? 
uh, boundaries between disciplines created as a way to define and create little kingdoms? Um, and is the discussion about practice research creating a horizontal organization structure that questions hierarchy in concept and knowledge creation? Yes. Yes, yes. it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a really simple answer to the question. The, the other way, the other way uh, uh, of asking that question is why do why do why do universities or any higher education institutions encourage inter or multidisciplinary design? Because that's where all the money is. I mean, let's be, let's be, let's cut to the chase a little bit. That's where one of the things I do want to say is, and this, and, and I, I won't mention the ref again. Um, but one of the issues is that the institutional responsibility for advancing design in research has got to be taken seriously. And where your QR money goes, i.e., where your ref money goes, has got to be invested in the discipline. And I'll tell you, because it's now out in the public domain, there's a big hole in the middle of design research. And it's about the institutional responsibility for focusing on the subject. And what you've got is all the stuff is around the edge. It's all going into inter- and multidisciplinary work. And that is a real issue for advancing our own field. Can I just pick up? Because Leslie Ann and I had a very interesting conversation. and. Um, it was very anecdotal, but both of us working in healthcare and in transdisciplinary um, ways, and we were, spoke about the challenges of publishing. So scientific journals have very high impact. So members of my team say, we've got to get this research into the British Medical Journal, Global Health, fantastic, but actually too much design is not going to get it in there. On the other hand, you've first also got to find a journal that will allow this, um, th these discussions to take place. And then at the other hand, you say, well, I'll put it in a de design journal. And they go, well, gosh, the school's quite low for that. So actually, there's these inequalities just in terms of actually, you know, we're, we're, we're still um, conditioned to have to publish in journals in a system that is predicated on a very siloed way of working and where disciplines, as Anne completely says, there is so much inequality. Um, so I, I think there are some fundamentals here that actually need to be challenged as well. Sorry, I, as a chair, I'm... <laughs> I, Kat, would you like to comment on that? Oh. Uh, no, not in relation to design specifically. Right. Thank you. Just to say that, yes, understanding the institutional logics is really important and uh, uh, Lucy Guy in the room, Ramya and many others um, poke uh, in the right direction and also my colleague Justin Bailey who is looking at knowledge and power in relation to design uh, will, um, will hopefully do something unsettling in the next 10 years in that space. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, go, go for it. All right. Hi, I'm Guy Julia from Aalto mm -hmm. University in Finland. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of things which Alison said and maybe challenge them. Um, uh, the one, two interventions back, you talk, we're talking about science. Um, and there's a danger of stereotyping science as being this entirely sort of lab kind of activity. I know you're going to. Yeah, disagree with what you see yourself there. Uh, you know, if we look at environmental sciences, for example, there's a huge amount of citizen science and public science and that sort of thing. Yeah, which engages communities in data production and so on. And I just wonder, therefore, likewise, to sort of stereotype other sciences as being, you know, having these impact factors. You know, they're all worried about this sort of stuff as well. And I just want to suggest that we also think about, in the same way that CAT works with sociology bleeding out into other areas and worry about other areas, thus, you know, many of the sciences do that, have those same worries, and it's worth, worth sort of thinking about that. I think I would like to pick up on that. I think you're absolutely right. There is a lot of public engagement in science. However, it is public engagement, and it tends not to be iterative. It is not as, as an, now, I can't talk about environmental scientists, but I know in terms of um, all sorts of plant molecular technologies, antimicrobial resistance, microbiology, zoonotic diseases. The dialogue in terms of change is not an ongoing process throughout a research project. It will be at intervals where the um, communication is put as a point in which that 
research is fed back to a community. What is not embedded, which I think in terms of practice, is the ongoing dialogical approach, and those are quite distinctive. So when I talk about the lab research, it's not that they don't engage with the public. There's lots of brilliant citizen science through all sorts of digital media. I absolutely respect that. But actually, it's more this embeddedness within communities, whether it's with patient groups or actually with communities who really are out of the conversation of science, where this is a, a long-term relational process. So. Yeah, okay. So let me just disagree with myself now. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I took part in a uh, two-year project looking at the impact of art and um, sport and culture on yeah. well-being, and we did a huge literature review. Mm. And so much of that clinical work was very much about the intervention along a you know, particular moment of time with a particular public. I was completely missing the sort of situatedness of those kinds of practices yeah. in sport, in culture, in arts, and, and so on. And this was, you know, a real lacuna, something really missing in the research. And I think, yes, you know, that is what tends to get constantly reproduced. That's what the kind of socio-material being of those uh, practices. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you. And I've just help, sorry, I think we've, we've run out of time. I'm so sorry, but thank you everybody for your contributions and also for this amazing conversation from the panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>